Evening, welcome to Five Live Cricket. England's Test Summer starts this week with a one-off game against Ireland. We'll preview that game. We'll look at Jason Roy's decision to finish his ECB contract to join Major League Cricket. Uh, and we'll also reflect on the IPL final between Gujarat Titans and Chennai Super Kings, which has just finished. I've got Tammy Beaumont with us, Stephen Finn uh, and Phil Tufnell. Did any of you see the end of that just then? Missed it. No, oh, brilliant. Right, <laughs> anyhow. So, before the news, uh, Chennai Super Kings needed 10 of two balls. So if yeah. you were waiting for us to give you the update, Jadeja hit a six and oh. then a four, and Chennai Super Kings wow. have won. There was wow. a reduced target because of the rain, uh, but they've beaten Gujarat Titans, uh, who look distraught at the moment, and Chennai Super Kings have won their fifth IPL title by five Wickets. Uh, I know none of you have seen that final, but I have to say I've really enjoyed the IPL, Stephen, this season. Oh, can't hear Stephen. Excellent. Stephen. Phil, do you want to go? Do you want to go? We'll try well, and get yes. Stephen. Well, it just seems to be going from strength yeah. to strength. And, and that's, a fantastic, that's a fantastic win from Chennai Super Kings, you know, because they weren't that fancied, but they've just sort of grown into this competition. And, uh, I mean, what an end. You know, 10 for two balls, six... Who was doing the bowling? Who bowled it, do you know? Uh, it Don't was... Know. Uh, let me find out. I, I was Not find out. I was, I was concentrating so much on <laughs> Jadeja's six and four. I'll, yeah. I'll find out. Um, well, he's going to be gutted, whoever it is, yeah, because is. Um, <laughs> they had the winning of that. But, I mean, Dhoni does it again, isn't it? Dhoni just seems to have that, um, that Midas touch with CSK. Sharma with the final over. Oh, gutted. Um... Uh, well, he does, doesn't he? But that, but Tammy, Phil's point is right. Gujarat Titans were probably the favourites and they won the league, didn't they, in the, in the overall season and they're defending champions as well. Yeah, it's always the way in tournament cricket. The people that actually win the league and almost go straight through don't necessarily always win. I think it's all about momentum in, in kind of T20 franchises and, um, yeah, MS Dhoni just... He doesn't get any older, does he? He just keeps winning. <laughs> he he looked the calmest person on the in the dugout compared mm. to everybody. I mean, people in the crowd in tears ahead of those final two balls. Let's see if we've got Stephen. Stephen, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Yeah, we we can hear. Um, yeah, there's been some unbelievably close games, haven't they? Even when a team seems to be cruising it this year in the IPL, they've um, somehow managed to bring it back to be an almost level playing field by the end. So. Yeah, the tournament, it seems to have gone on forever, doesn't it, really? Yes. But there have been some amazing games in there. Um, and the best playing against the best can only be a good thing. And, and yeah, I think it's 100,000 people in that stadium this evening and, and they'll all be loving that. Yeah, and, and they stayed through all the rain delays and, uh, and everything else. So over the course of the next hour, we'll talk a little bit more about the IPL. Uh, we'll talk about uh, player contracts and what is happening, also what is happening with the blast, we'll look ahead to England against Ireland as well. Um, how, how has the women's domestic season begun, Tammy? I know you played for the Blaze today, beating the, the Southern Vipers and, and Blaze winning in the final over. How has that begun with both the Rachel Hayhoe Flint and the Charlotte Edwards trophies, cups, both going on? Yeah, as, um, we're a new new kind of team um, representing the, the West Midlands in the Blaze and we've actually gone unbeaten so far. So um, I think we're unbeaten to, uh, until June. So that's pretty awesome to say, you know, we came across from Lightning Cricket last year and uh, didn't necessarily have the best record um, when, we were, when we were based at Loughborough Uni. So we've started really So what's really changed? Well and, uh, well, we've attracted some, some England players. So we got Nat Siver Brunt has played a couple of T20s for us. Sarah Glenn's moved over from the Central Sparks and um, also we managed to get um, a really absolute jet of a cricketer, Nadine de Klerk, as an overseas player, has come over from South Africa and I think every single game she's either contributed with the ball or bat or in the field. Uh, one game she actually got seven for her against Northern Diamonds, so um, she's been an absolute brilliant signing. Do you, do you think one of the um, one of the keys going forward for, for domestic women's cricket is a great greater spread of talent. I mean, I know the draft, a, a sort of partial draft, was brought in for the hundred that ahead of this season. But do you think trying to spread the talent out a little bit more can only help the game? 
Yeah, I certainly think that that is um, a really good case for it. The, the draft in the 100 was almost necessary, I believe. But this year in the, the regional game, you know, everyone started to beat everyone. And I think it's kind of happening organi- organically now that there's no kind of set salary base. You can offer people more money, more opportunity to move. Um, and you've seen a lot of people move um, regions this year and actually they're having a massive impact. And there's no easy games of regional cricket anymore. I mean, even today, the Southern Vipers nearly defended 120. We were five down in the last over and we got there. But, um, you know, last week, Nat Siva put on a hundred, uh, well, made us get 200 at Leicester. So I think the game's really growing and it's great to see so many people coming out to support it the last month or so as well. In both in the men's and the women's, I wonder how much the, the Ashes this summer is dominating things, Stephen, at a domestic level. Yeah, I think there's a lot of um, talk about it, isn't there? I think the fact that we've had Australians playing in our domestic competition, in the four-day competition, I think is a good thing. Um, for it and for the integrity of it and yeah there's a people jostling for places aren't they I know that the squad has been picked for that men's ashes um, first test or the, the island test and then maybe the first test of the ashes series after that but there are still competition for places especially bowling places with injuries and the fact that it's five test matches very close to each other it means that there's that little bit more pressure on people who are on the periphery um, of that England squad to to put in good performance in the domestic game and I think that actually some young people are catching the eye and, and there's a couple of outsiders that I would think that, that would have half a chance of playing in this Ashes series from a bowling perspective Such as? I think Gus Atkinson actually I've watched him bowl closely for Surrey um, against Middlesex on the TV but he's someone that over the last couple of years you watch him bowl and you think oh he's actually got something that's a little bit special and a little bit different to other people um, and he bowled very well in that game on TV for Surrey um, mm-hmm. he's playing in a winning successful team which I think counts for quite a lot um, and I just watch him bowl and I think he looks like an international bowler because they've, 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 Phil they've already brought Josh mm-hmm. Tung in haven't they into this Ireland squad which might be a name that's come out of the blue for a lot of people well, a little bit yeah for sure but uh, as Finney was saying there what an opportunity I mean the guys are sort of getting injured quite yeah. regularly you know if and it's the and then that's the way it should be you know it shouldn't be a closed shop it should be that people um, at the start of every season are there you know banging on the door knocking on the door you know with the rate of runs or the way they bowl and uh, yeah no fair play to Josh Tug as you say don't know a lot about him to be mm. honest with you but uh, he's obviously caught the eye um it's for Worcester, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. Um, so he's obviously been doing something right. But the one thing that you do know w- w- with this England setup is that um, there'll be people out there watching all these fellas. So, you know, they haven't just had a bit of a, you know, no. they haven't just plucked someone out of nowhere. You know, these guys are And he has well been monitored. around the camp before, has, has Josh yeah, Tung. He has right. been around the England camp. Stephen? Yeah. Yeah, he has. He, he's been around in the Lions team. I think yeah. he took a five for on their tour to Sri Lanka earlier in the year and he also knocked Steve Smith over for Worcestershire um, in his game versus Sussex a few (laughs) weeks ago Um, it was questionable I think DRS might have had something to (laughs) say about it Um, and Steve Smith wasn't that happy with the decision Um, but but, yeah he he bowled yeah, he's had a couple of dodgy ones for us. Yeah, but, what, um, what, hap- what happens, Stephen, when you when you have an Australian in Steve Smith within your ranks yeah. in an Ashes summer? Well, at Sussex, we've got a very young, impressionable team. And actually having someone like that in the dressing room for the young batters and the guys who are making their way in the game to see how he operates as the best player in the world or consistently over the last... 10 years probably one of the best players in the world Um, and to have him in amongst your ranks in with 18, 19, 20 year olds trying to make their way in the game it it actually is a really big positive I think for the domestic game and for those young players to see how he goes about it um, to see his mentality towards training his mentality towards when he's out there Um, and also the fact that that yes he he obviously takes his cricket very seriously but also there's a work-life balance that I think that he as an older player has as well and and for those guys to see that it's okay to take a step back sometimes um, and give yourself an afternoon off training or an afternoon just to mentally get away from the game um, to know that the best player in the world trusts himself to do that and then do that yourself I think gives you a lot of confidence so it's been really good to have him at Sussex 
Yeah, Finney, what, have, have you sort of picked up anything from him while he's been there? Well, he's got LB three times in three well, innings yeah. for us, so that, that's good news for the England bowlers. Um, yeah, bowl straight. But, <laughs> I, I think actually the... You know, he's a superstar, really, of the international mm. game. He's, he's played IPLs, he's play, played magnificently for Australia across all formats for a long period of time. Um, but you also realise that he's just a normal guy. You know, he, he plays his cricket, he plays his cricket hard, he practices hard. Um, but but he is a normal person and, and there's a human side to him as well that when you don't know and you look from afar, um, you think these guys who are the best in the world are just absolute monsters and, and not approachable people. Um, he fitted in really well with us at Sussex and everyone loved having him here and it's made a real positive impact yeah. on the club and I think on domestic cricket in general. How much yeah, of it, the, it... Oh, sorry, well, go on, Phil. Well, no, it's going to be crucial, isn't it, Steve Smith? Crikey, I remember... I mean, he, got, he, got, he nearly beat Don Bradman's record yeah. last time he was mm. over here, didn't mm. he? Yeah. Or something. Mm. I just kept seeing him trudging out and, uh, you know, <laughs> after every break, I mean, he played fabulously well, so England are going to have to find a way. Uh, how much is the women's Ashes dominating the, the women's side of things at the moment, Tammy? Yeah, it's the big one, isn't it? Um, you know, obviously Australia are world class and have won everything over the last few years, so it's going to be a real tough test for us. But um, yeah, it's something, you know, we've heard. We're at the big venues, we're at places like Trent Bridge, Lords, the Oval, that a lot of people are, in women's cricket have never played an international at. So really exciting and we're hearing that there's going to be record crowds and yeah, that excitement's really building and hopefully it'll be a really good contest. Uh, how big an impact do you think Meg Lanning missing mm. the Ashes will have? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really upset, like a little bit upsetting to see she's missing out again with medical reasons. So, ma massively hope she gets well soon because you want to see someone like that playing, mm. even if it's not against you. Um, but I think, you know, we actually went out there a couple of years ago and she was having sh shoulder surgery and it actually didn't make that much of a difference. They've got leaders ready to step up and they've got batters to, ready to step in. So, yeah, it's just one person we maybe don't have to have a long meeting about what fields we set but someone else will probably step up and take her place and um, yeah I mean it's a big miss for them but hopefully um, yeah we'll capitalise on it uh, Tammy Beaumont Phil Tufnell Stephen Finn on 5 Live Cricket um, let's talk player contracts uh, and this has really been provoked by Jason Roy ending his incremental contract with the ECB to play in Major League Cricket he's going to uh, join the LA Knight Riders um, who are uh, part of the ownership group, obviously own the Kolkata Knight Riders in the IPL. Do you do you get a sense, Phil, mm. that this is going to... Yeah. It's just the start. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the start of things to come, I yeah. think, mate. I think, I think it's... It's got to be addressed. I mean, people know it's coming, you know what I mean? They are knowing it's coming and they've, they've, they've really got to sit down and sort of think about it because it's <laughs> there is a situation here where um, it's sort of like the players are going to be in total control, isn't it, really? Mm. I mean, they can just pull out a plan for England and England, if anything, are going to have to go sort of, you know, with the begging bowl out and say, would you fancy coming to play for us for a yeah. couple of months? You know, it's the ashes, you know what I mean? So um, I think it is a bit of a worry. I think that people have got to sit down and think about it, but I honestly can't see a, a way sort of out of it, you know? I mean, if the if the money's there and people are free to do exactly what they want, um, you know, and I can understand Jason's mentality, you know, he's seen a he's seen a nice paycheck there and he's just thought to himself, well, hold on a minute. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go over there and sort of enjoy my cricket and go over there and see what's going on. So um, I totally understand his reasoning, but uh, yes, it, it, it's slightly concerned. Well, it's, it's very concerning for Test cricket. It's as simple as that. I, I would... Um, uh, you take, you or sorry, take, international cricket, no, yeah, not just yeah. Test cricket. Yeah, yeah white boy and everything. I mean, you take yeah. a couple of things out of Phil's answer, Tammy, don't you, that... One, I'm not sure what can be done about it. And secondly, from a player's point of view, why would you not take, I think, six figures to go and play in LA for a month? Lovely. Yeah, yeah I mean, really you know. Um, <laughs> I think particularly you're seeing in the women's game already that um, some of the nations that are unfortunately not as well provided for with national contracts that players are already retiring and doing the T20 circuit around the world because that might be more lucrative than than say what they could get in their in their home country and um, I really hope it doesn't go that way for for England women's players but at the same time there's not going to be much you know international competition if the best players are off um, just trying to 
yeah, go to these franchises and, and make some money. But at the same time, yeah, as a player, it's hard to turn down when, you know, cricket's such a short career, any professional sport's such a short career. You've got to try and capitalise while you can. And, and the game is quite lucrative now for all the T20 leagues. It, it, it's quite a strange sort of feeling, actually, Chappers. You know what I mean? You sort of, you know, you understand that T20 franchise cricket and all this kind of thing. But I'm just sort of, I'm left sort of just sort of in the middle a bit, if you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I, I love me international cricket. I love me test cricket. Listen, I, I love T20 and everything and franchise cricket as well. But, you know, I, I, I just think it's going to be, you know, it's going to be... A, a poorer world, you know, if there's no international cricket, it's as simple as that. Or international cricket is almost then relegated right to the back of the queue, um, you know, so... Or yeah, international might... cricket only becomes a thing yes. that England, Australia and India can demand players play Ab and you may get South Africa or, or Pakistan. Then, that, I mean, that's poorer. Yeah, absolutely. And we keep sort of going on about trying to develop... Uh, develop the sort of like you know lesser sort of countries and you know get them playing test cricket and what have you well at the moment they must just be looking at themselves and going well what's the point because in i can see in 10 or 15 years time we're not even going to be playing much test cricket Stephen, yeah well i i think cricket sort of created a monster for itself um yeah. at the moment um and it's sort of consuming itself from the inside out um i, did, I i'm with phil i i think it's very hard to foresee a future where almost every big um, international player isn't on a IPL central contract of some yep. sort um, for an absolute fortune um, and then the international teams have to try and convince their players to come back um, and the IPL franchises are going to be reluctant to let them go because of the investment that that they hold in the player paying them big contracts for two years mm. at a time so I think cricket's in a pretty precarious situation right now um, the only way that I can foresee us coming through this is probably the ICC and the owners of the IPL franchises who are going around and buying to uh, teams in all these tournaments um, is sitting those people down in a room and negotiating with them to say we need international cricket in these windows um, and this is when it's going to be this is when it's going to be played and, and for us to retain the integrity of international sport um, then we need to make sure that these windows exist. Um, th the only problem then is also that you look at our country here, the UK, um, and we're very reliant on the broadcast deal with Sky Sports um, yeah. to prop up the game, to prop up the counties, to prop up the infrastructure below that. Um, grassroots cricket is all propped up by the broadcast deal that is Sky Sports and a lot of that is England cricket or uh, England men's and women's cricket but a lot of it is the best players playing for England in order to get people watching it so they can sell the advertising which makes the broadcast deal worth what it is. If that broadcast deal, if they're renegotiating that broadcast deal and the best players aren't available to play for England all the time, they're off playing for these franchises, that devalues the broadcast deal, which then means less money goes to the counties, less money goes to infrastructure, less money goes to grassroots. And that's the really worrying thing when you look into the future um, about how we deal with those um, challenges, I think. I, I don't... Bar that negotiation that you say, Stephen, I, I don't know how you combat the... No. The 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 market forces, the free world economics of billionaire Indian families and owners who are making probably even more money through the IPL than going and buying teams in or new franchises, setting them up in South Africa, which is what they've done, haven't they? And, well, it's and, the, isn't and, it the second? It's the second um, highest paying yeah. per game. Um, TV deal, the IPL yeah. deal that they signed this year in history. It's only second to the NFL. Mm. And you think it's bigger than the cool. NBA, it's bigger than Premier League cool. football, which is wild yeah. to think. Yeah. Um, and that's where the money is. The market is the, the eyeballs on the television sets in India um, that, that then mean that that deal is worth as and much as it is. And if they then go, right, we'll have the South African one and we'll do a T10 and we'll do one in America and we'll have a pool of 10 who we centrally contract and then in each of those other leagues maybe not America at the moment I don't know what the domestic talent is like in America but we throw four or five local players into those teams 
you you can understand why why that is attractive to a lot of different people. I, mm. Not traditionalists, obviously, and not those of us that want international cricket to survive. But you can see how it gathers momentum. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it has, it has gathered the momentum, hasn't yeah. it, as you say? And as soon as the states sort of get involved and everything, you know what I mean? If that sort of takes root and, and starts to flourish as well, well, you know, I, I, I think international cricket has got to be very, very careful. And the world will be a, a poorer place for it. It will be a poorer place for it. So, uh, uh, Steve's... I'd like to be in that room, Steve, when they sit down and try and get those windows sorted out mm. because there's their, um, you know, as you say, the, the market forces and money talks, doesn't it? And the, you, I think I was reading the other day as well that the IPL players, in terms of what their revenue share with the owners is, um, I think Premier League football, it's 70% goes to the players. I think the NFL, it's about 50% goes to the players. The IPL, it's 16% goes to the players. Yeah. So those deals are only going to get bigger to entice people away from international cricket and international cricket can't compete with that money I don't think and, and this is this is coming at the worst possible time for the women's game Tammy because you've already mentioned some players who are start, who've, who are choosing franchises over country but it'll it will it will increase that because of the unbelievable success after just one year of the women's Premier League yeah, it will. I think the women's IPL was, um, yeah, brilliant and almost long overdue. But again, it's almost raised the standard of what a women's tournament's got to do. And you and see the, the W and the price and the and the prize money and um, yeah, what what it takes to actually take women's cricket seriously. And it's it's great to see. But yeah, it's coming at, on that kind of double edged sword of what the future might hold. And again, it's the same three countries: Australia, India, and England that can afford to try and keep their players but the others are really going to struggle to keep any any really talented players from yeah staying home and being in their own leagues or, or representing their own country and um, I'm a massive traditionalist I, I love test cricket and um, yeah really hope that both can coexist because you can see both sides as a player but um, yeah for me test cricket's the pinnacle so but, hopefully we can sort something out. But nobody can compete with their financial might can they so so you, i think you've already seen a little bit there are some there are some players who played in the women's ipl who now won't come over here this summer don't need to come over here this summer yeah exactly you saw how many of the australian players um pulled out of the hundred um just because you know they've got such lucrative deals and they didn't need to be away from home for for all that time um i think you know some of the more talented players from the likes of south africa west indies um they'll still come they'll they'll want to be part of everything um just because they're maybe you know happy to leave their international team behind but um yeah i think it's it's raising the game and the hundred if they want to attract the the best talent are going to have to up the salary bands and get them closer to the men's and you know on on one side of the coin it's great that we're we're pushing towards equality with the men's game because there's so much money mm. being thrown in it but at the same time we almost can learn lessons from the men's game from maybe 10 5 years ago and we've got to learn them fast or we could go the same way do, do you see a scenario Stephen where these owners invest in english cricket well i i think that realistically going into the future that the 100 will end up being privately owned franchises. I mean, I'd be very surprised and that's not coming from any inside knowledge or anything. No. I, it's just the way that my gut feeling says that for the 100 to, to survive and to remain a viable thing in this country, I think it needs outside investment. Um, and, and yeah, I think there's you know the already things coming out this week about the financial state of the game in this country. Um, and I think with that outside investment in the hundred, um, then then I I can see that becoming a more viable product moving forward. I would say. Phil, yeah, I, I just. I, do, I, I just panic. I panic for international cricket. Without international cricket, it's all very, very well and good, you know, having, you know, all these franchises and things like that. But without international cricket, there's no sort of start or, you know what I mean, or basis to it in mm. my book, you know what I mean? You, you, you kind of have to have that to then have all these franchises in my eyes. But I think that that day might... You know, you know, be be we might be losing that sort of day, which is then a real panic for me because, you know, crikey, O'Reilly, listen, I love it and everything, but um, 
you know, I mean, uh, you know, England, Australia and India, Pakistan and these kind of things, you know, that, I've grown up with them all my life, you know. I mean, the Trent Rockets and everything are all great and well and good and the Delhi Capitals and all that is all very well and good. But if they're... If you if you don't have that sort of as Tammy said that sort of pinnacle, mm. well, it, it's just going to be a it's just going to be like a the same, sea well, it's of, just going to be the same thing over and over yeah, and over yeah, and over absolutely. and over oh, again. A, there's another slower ball. There's yeah. another wide yorker. There's yeah. another back of the hand slower ball. You kind of know what's going to happen in a funny sort of way. It's very exciting and everything and what have you. But there's just not that sort of um, that sort of nuance sort of essence. Yeah, yes, essence mm. of what the game is and. Yeah, it's a it's a worry, that's for sure. But I don't know how we're going to stop it. Well, I get I get the feeling, and and from players, I still feel a massive passion and desire to play for your country. And I think Jason Roy, in taking the deal over in America, he still said outright that once those new round of contracts come in in October, um, he wants to be thought about in those. He wants to play in the World Cup. His passion is still playing for England and representing England on that stage and there's no sense from me at the moment that the players who who are in line to play in the Ashes or um, in line to be first choices in those international teams, um, that, that there's no question in my mind that they want to be representing their country. I think the problem comes is when the IPL owners almost hold players to ransom and say, okay, this is, yeah. mm-hmm. this is the contract I'm offering you. It's this and no international cricket or nothing at all. And I think that that puts players into really, really tricky situations when you've got a career that, if you're very lucky, lasts 15 years. Uh, Tammy, we will leave it there with you. Thank you for being with us for this half hour. Thank you. See you soon. Tammy Cheers, Tammy. with us on Five Tammy. Live Cricket. Um, we're going to talk... Um, England, Ireland. Uh, we're going to hear from Brendan McCullum uh, shortly. Although we're now going to do what we've just been discussing, which is put the IPL before international cricket, because we're going to talk about <laughs> Chennai Super Kings winning that final after an extraordinary finale against the Gujarat Titans. Unbelievable stuff from Mohit Sharma, who runs in again, delivers to Jadeja, six, goes length, and has six. that been smashed down the ground for six? It's cleared the rope. The Chennai Super Kings are still in it. Ravi Jadeja, out of nowhere, wow. has just plonked Mohit Sharma straight back over his head. Four needed to win. Gujarat fans, Mehmet Dhoni, has got his eyes shut. He's fraying as well. Final ball of the IPL coming up then. Four to win. It's a full toss down the leg side and Jadeja flicks it on his way. It's gone away to the boundary down towards Whoa. fine leg. How has that happened? Chennai Super Kings win the match. Off the very final delivery, Jadeja goes six, four, and look at the celebrations. The conclusion was on Sports Extra. Simon Mann, part of the commentary team. I actually thought Gujarat had done it with ten off two needed. I think they did too, Yeah, uh, Mark, as well. I think they, they thought they had the game. Mohit Sharma had bowled a brilliant last over, needing to defend 13. Three singles and a dot ball. He, he found his Yorker length. It was really difficult to, to get him away. And then Jadeja played a magnificent shot. It wasn't quite full enough. Hit it down the ground for six. And then the final ball was a bit of a gift. It was on his pads, a full toss. Fine leg was up inside the circle. And Jadeja was able to flick it away. That makes it sound simple. But, of course, it wasn't under the pressure. You know, a vast crowd that stayed on it. The game finished at about half past one in the morning. We had two hours of rain. It was, But people stayed on. And they were ultimately rewarded by a, a compelling, stunning, dramatic, almost uh, unbelievable finish, really. Well, the... The fact that it was so late, the fact that we'd had rain, the fact that it had been delayed by a day, I mean, it all contributed to the drama. And there were there were thousands of people, it looked like, on the shots I was seeing, who were in tears with two balls to well, go. Well, the, well the, the television camera focused on a Chennai Super King support. He's quite young. And she was in tears when Mohit was bowling those Yorker after Yorker. Said, this, this game is over. Oh, you know, we, we can't win it. And I bet she was a bit happier, uh, you know, two or three balls later when Ravage Jadeja uh, did his thing. I mean, it had all sorts this game because MS Dhoni came in as well. And he thought, ah, oh, here he is. He's come in to hit the winning runs. They needed, you know, it was something like they needed about 20 odd off 14 balls, something like that. And he came and he drilled his first ball straight to extra cover. So he was out first ball. That wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, but they found a hero 
in the end uh, with, with Ravi Jadeja just keeping his nerve. I felt sorry for Mohit because, you know, you've got to defend 13, not easy to do. It sounds quite a lot, but, it's, you know, it's not easy to do in the modern game with the quality of player out there. And he, he bowled so well and then j just got it fractionally wrong with that, with that penultimate ball and then very wrong, really, uh, with the final ball. It was a, a bit of a gift and Jadeja was able to profit from it. And also, you've got to feel sorry for someone like Sai Sudderson as well, the 21-year-old who plays the Gujarat Titans. He's born in Chennai. He played the innings of his life. Seven, 96 from 47 balls. <laughs> Wonderful innings. Fantastic hitting in that 214 for four. But I don't know whether they were, if they were forced to chase the full 215, whether it would have been, you know, a, a bit too much for Chennai, but it was reduced. 171 of 15 overs. Concentrated the mind. They went for it right from the start. And you, you always thought they were likely winners uh, during their batting effort. Yeah, and, and just the final thing on that, we touched on it with, with Tammy and Stephen as well, is that Gujarat Titans were probably the favourites all the way through this. I mean, they, they won the, the the league standings. They they have been the best team throughout throughout the course of the season. Yeah, they've been the best team for the last two yeah. years because they won it last year as well. Uh, you know, first time that, as a franchise in the IPL and they looked as if, well, you know, with two balls left, you would have you know, backed them to win it uh, this time round. Yeah, winning 10 of the 14 games. Chennai kept sort of pace with them. They, were, they finished second. So the top two teams in the league stage made it through, uh, through the playoffs uh, to the final. And at the halfway stage, you thought, yeah, Gujarat Titans have got this, 214 for four. You don't, you don't often chase that many uh, to win in T20. In fact, it's never been done. It, it, it would have well, it would have been the highest score to chase in an IPL final, 215, because they didn't have to chase that many in the end uh, because of the the rain delay. I've never seen rain like it. It was an un incredible deluge, uh, which delayed the, the match for about two and a half hours. Because anywhere else in the world, Mark, you know, everyone would have picked up the stumps and gone home. But <laughs> in India, no, no. We, we, okay, we've lost two and a half hours to rain. It, you know, it's past midnight. Oh no, we can still have 50, still have 15 overs. <laughs> Uh, Simon Tuffers here. Hello, Tuffers. Hello, mate. Um, uh, was was MS Dhoni still the the coolest man in the ground? Was he? I mean, he's well, he's, he's a special kind of player. Really. Well, he, yeah. I mean, he doesn't seem to show any emotion at all <laughs> during the whole match. And it, it, I did I did see a shot of him smiling at the end. Oh, but I mean, Jadeja yeah. was leaping around. His teammates were chasing him. Dhoni, I don't think even watched the final ball. He seemed to have his eyes closed and was just looking to the ground. And there was very little emotion on his face uh, throughout the innings. I mean, he knows the cameras are on him the whole time, you know, because simply they are, you know, they're, they're always focusing on him. But he didn't, he didn't seem to show a, a flicker of emotion, but then he just strolled onto the ground at the end and, and smiled a bit. And, you know, <laughs> he'll be lifting the trophy. So there we go. Yeah. It all worked. And wh is it going to be his last IPL? And yeah. uh, No one knows. He doesn't know mm. yet either. He says he's going to wait until December or so to, to make a decision. Give it one last dance, maybe. Thank you, uh, Simon. Simon Mann with us. Let's talk about test cricket then. England men's first test of the summer starts on Thursday, taking on Ireland at Lords in their only test before the Ashes. Phil will be part of the TMS team there. Let's hear from Brendan McCullum. He says it's a good opportunity to reconnect as a side. For us, it's, um, you know, we've been together now for a couple of days. We had a get together yesterday and then obviously first training today. We've got a couple of trainings, then we lead into the Ireland test. So, it's a great opportunity to just reconnect as a team and to remind ourselves of all those things that we've that we've done well, a couple of areas that we can polish up and, and to try and get that real atmosphere and, and feeling within the group back again and get the rhythm of, of how we operate back. And you know, it's a, a good opportunity against Ireland who no doubt will be excited to play us as well and in, uh, in a fully fledged test match and, and hopefully we're able to put our best foot forward. I'm, I'm sure we'll play the style of cricket that we want and, and we'll see where we end up with the result. As a management group, you've taken the decision to leave Ben Folks out of the squad for this test match. You were the one who had that conversation with him. Firstly, talk us through that decision and, and also how, how Ben took that decision. Yeah, look, it's, it's tough, right? International sport is, is really tough and sometimes tough calls have to be make, uh, made. And there's always going to be you know, one or two guys who can count themselves unlucky. And I think Folks is one of those guys. Um, he's been excellent for us for a period of time. and. Um, you know, he's played some really pivotal um, uh, knocks and also the roles that he's had with the gloves. So it's a tough call. Um, but in the end, we've, we've gone with the, with the side that we think gives us our best opportunity and, and we'll see where we land. But look, folks, he was great when I rang him. He's naturally disappointed, of course, and you know, he still remains a big part of this side moving forward. Um, it's just unfortunate that he, uh, he was the one that missed out this time around. 
So you mentioned that sort of big summer and, and, and how important it is. England fans are really excited about this Ashes series. Do you feel that excitement? Do you feel their excitement and, and what this summer could do for, for Test cricket itself? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, you know, everywhere you go, it's, there's people talking about how how great the summer's going to be. And I think, you know, that's a testament to both teams too, right? I think it's such an anticipated series because, well, it always is the Ashes, I'm sure, but on this particular occasion, because of how both teams are coming into this with the belief in their games uh, and the quality of players that both sides possess, I think that creates that anticipation and, and maybe a level of expectation as well. Um, but that's what you want, right? Like it's, it's a great honour to be in the position that we're in to be able to try and hopefully entertain and inspire people to to want to follow this team, want to want to be a part of this um, this sport, and and to hopefully try and captivate some people um, that may not have uh, been been uh, necessarily that keen on on cricket, or maybe not have been grabbed beforehand. To have that opportunity is something that we're, that we're immensely proud of. Uh, Brendan McCullum there. I, I mean, he's done previous interviews, Stephen, where he says actually one of the one of the most important things as as teams, as he brings them together, is as we said at the start, just that opportunity to reconnect and actually give them give them some fun about being part of a test side again. Well, I think there's a great degree of simplicity around what Brendan McCullum does with his teams uh, and the best leaders that I've always played under, whether that's coaches or captains is the simplicity with which they communicate things and, and how simple they make it seem to you as a player to be able to go out there and do your job and one of Brendan McCullum's big things is um, his want for people to love and enjoy what they're doing and to entertain whilst they're doing it and those are his simple messages um, and if you fit into that and you buy into that culture you can really get the best out of yourself. And he did that with New Zealand when he took over them and took them to the World Cup final in 2015, turned them into an outstanding test match team as well in the same breath. Um, and he's doing that with this England team now. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting when he mentioned about Folksy. I mean, you know, hard lines on him. He's been, he's been playing fantastic. Will it come back and bite England in the ashes? Still, the, you know, probably the best... Um, wicketkeeper batsman averaging about 40 but he, he, he's lucky Brendan as I said I, I know him reasonably well and it, when you're told you're not playing from someone like Brendan he still makes you feel very sort of <laughs> well okay do you know what I mean it's not the end of the world do you know what I mean and he sort of puts it so as you say like Finney said a bit sort of simplistic that you just sort of walk away and go oh well you know I get that well that's alright you know I'll keep going and I'll keep going I'm part of the team da, 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 da. you know in years gone by well they didn't even used to tell you really but um, <laughs> you know when, when, they, when they eventually did sort of tell you, you you sort of took it to heart and you sort of had a bit of a moan at them because sometimes you couldn't see it but you know as you say those great leaders and, and, and great sort of man managers have that ability you, just to do that t Two part question then Phil yeah. um, One do you agree with the decision to leave Ben Folks out yeah. Secondly how many seasons do you think we spend talking about England wicket keeping options? It feels like it feels like maybe yeah. bar a five year period with Jack Russell, it's happened all the way through my youth, uh, <laughs> all the way into my professional career. I, I can very rarely remember a time when we weren't talking about wicket keepers. But, well, it's a genuine all rounder spot now, isn't it? Mm. You know what I mean? That has changed, you know, and we've been blessed, absolutely blessed, you know, like a Butler and these guys. I mean. Blimey, O'Reilly, I mean, these, they're absolutely top of their game. Um, I think it's... I, I think Johnny Bairstow, well, he made it clear, didn't he? He said, Johnny Bairstow comes back for me when he's fit. It's as simple as that. So he's put a lot of belief behind Johnny Bairstow from his amazing summer last summer. But he didn't have to come back as a keeper, did he? Well, I think, I think he kind of did in a funny right. sort of way. I mean, they were sort of talking about, does he open? Do you put Stokes into open? There's too many moving parts there. When you start a series, and I'm afraid that I was involved in too many, if the opposition see you quite not, you haven't quite got a settled side, you don't know quite who's going to be opening, who's going to be doing this, who's going to be doing that, they seize on that. If, if, if there's a sort of a settled side... It just means that you know what you're doing. We're all we're all facing the right way on the bus, and we're going for this. You know what I mean? Bar injury and what have you. If they would have started putting people, but you know, Stokes to open and things like that, I, I don't think 
you know, that team was working. It won 10 out of 12. And so you've, you've got to slot one back in. You've got to try and slot one back in. You don't want to then move three around to slot mm. that one back in. It's a lot simpler just to go boom, boom, and keep it all moving. And, and, and as you said, there's that reconnect then instead of like, oh, no one quite knows what they're doing. Crikey O'Reilly, this is an ashes. If you don't know what you're doing, you look, look at the one at Brisbane, yeah. you know, no one knew what they were doing. Mm. So um, I, I, I think that they just saw it as the sort of simplest route to just not sort of disrupt. Stephen? Yeah, I, I I completely agree with with that take. The the only thing I think if Harry Brook was another year into his international career, I think maybe we'd have seen him move up to open and Johnny Bairstow come in at five because I look at Brook batting and he's got probably the best technique out of that top seven to be able to deal with a moving ball at pace. Um so I think if it were to have this predicament in 12 months' time, I think that there's there's a half-decent chance that Harry Brook would have been asked to open. You um, see him opening, and, do you, Steve? You see, well, not, you see him? Not, not necessarily long-term, but I think as a, as a short-term sticking plaster to the problem that they had now, mm. um, I, I can see him having the technique and the temperament to be able to open the batting in test cricket. But having said that, I think the way that he's played at number five for a young man... I think is not worth disrupting. Um, so, I, yeah, I agree with everything Phil said, but, but yeah, the, the, of all of the options that were there for them to be able to get Ben Folks in the team, um, because I do think his wicket-keeping is something that is very valuable to England. Yeah. Um, I, I think the only way that I would have foreseen him being able to remain in the team would be Harry Brook opening. Yeah. And, and, and you, could, you, you know what's going to happen, though. You know what's going to happen, you know. God. <laughs> Bearstow's gonna, Bearstow's gonna drop a goober, you know what I mean, and, that, and all the people are gonna be going. I told you, like the Ben folks is it. So it is, it's a bit of a no-win situation, but I just think through loyalty, and um, and I think that that's what Brendan's then shown to to to, to Bearstow is that you know you you really did kickstart this sort of new way of playing, and 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 you just got to come back. Just just a final one, going back to your first point. Stephen about atmosphere and relaxed cricket and no fear of failure and so on and so forth is that all a little bit different when the Aussies are in town um, well no because I think it's important to retain that so Brendan will be making every effort and everything that he'll do around the team it's not going to be about upskilling in the two weeks until the Ashes starts it's not going to be about that it's not going to be about making sure you're extra steely and extra switched on and extra determined because you will be those things once that series comes around. But the way that you get the best out of yourself or the way that they'd have identified to get be the best out of this team is probably a better way of putting it um, because not every team reacts to that style of management the same. Um, but with this team, the way that they want to play their cricket right now, trying to make sure that they are relaxed and trying to make sure that they are switched off from the game when they're away from it to make sure that they're fresh when they come to the game is a hugely important part of of, um, of playing and playing well in a five-match Ashes and, series. But also switched off from the external noise because lose... Difficult. Difficult. Well, that, and that's my point, mm. Phil, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> yeah. look, I've not been in this situation, but let, lose a test against New Zealand at the start of the summer with no disrespect to New Zealand and it's it's less likely to make waves outside the cricketing fans and the cricketing public lose the opening test to Australia in a summer and that spreads further across the country that's that's not just a cricketing story that's a sporting story and in some ways becomes a news story I, I, I tell you also what might be good for England in that respect though is that they're all back to back virtually yeah. you know so it'll just be oh well you know not to worry off we go we're going somewhere else to have a go and we can get straight back into it so I think that that could actually help England's mindset a little bit that if this sort of if Mitchell Stark swings it round corners and Pat Cummins is nipping it all over and we get rock and rolled, um, you know, well, not to worry. And that's what I think Brendan will be doing. He'll be saying, listen, we've gone 1-0 down necessarily, for, you know, for argument's sake. But come on, right, off we go. We're going back up to, um, you know, wherever it is. And, and, and we go again. And I think that will suit this sort of style that he is then trying to sort of like, you know, get into this England side. And you'll hear him talk about entertaining. You hear Ben Stokes talking about entertaining. Um, he alluded to it there, Brendan, in his interview that we heard before. 
um, talking yeah. about entertaining the people. And actually, they're, they're taking the attitude into the games at the moment. They don't care if they lose. And I know that there's more pressure and more media hype around an Ashes series, but they will be strong. They're both strong-minded individuals, Stokes and McCullum. They will be so strong in the sense that they will not care about losing a game as long as it's entertaining. And they'll see that as a win. So that is their overarching thing that they're using at the moment um, to give the players motivation to play um, and, and to play motivate or, or to motivate the players to play in those tight games that we've seen through the summer and through the winter. And, and I think also with this, with, with that sort of mindset and why have you with this England side is that they know that they can come back. You know what I mean? In the, it, back in the old days, you go one down and you sort of like get a bit of a wallop in. You're thinking to yourself, this is going to be a really long road. But I think that, you know, if things, you know, there's going to be a few bumps in the road. But and, and, and if that does happen, I think they'll just dust themselves on and go, right, we go even harder next time. Um, let, let's talk about Ireland uh, and bring our guest in here because Ireland are the visitors to Lords and that'll be their first test against England since 2019. The men's national team selects Andrew White joins us. Evening, Andrew. Thanks for joining us. Evening, Mark. Evening, man. So, fir right. so first test against England since 2019. Since then, three Ireland have played three tests uh, earlier this year uh, against Bangladesh and against Sri Lanka. So I suppose... My first question is, just how difficult is it to get test matches as a less established nation? Well, it is difficult, um, especially especially at home, um, just obviously with the financial constraints around it. But as you say, we're just back from the subcontinent uh, where we had two tests against Sri Lanka, one test against Bangladesh. Um, now, for the guys that have been out there, it's, it's tough, tough conditions. Mm. Uh, the boys acquitted themselves very well. Some of the batters got uh, hundreds to their name, and uh, but obviously uh, England at large brings another challenge, uh, but one the guys will be looking forward to. So is it is it small steps as regards getting Test matches? You know, that, right? You've had those three. You're on the on the subcontinent. Brilliant. Now England again this summer, and but does does that then help you for next winter or or next summer? Yeah, I, th I think it, it's small steps is, is the right way to put it. Um, it's it's gaining exposure for the players in the longer format, uh, which is you know the the biggest challenge. And ultimately, um, you know, we've been brought up on a diet of of white ball cricket. The white ball game is extremely important to us, and uh, with World Cup qualif qualification um, later on this summer. But obviously, the opportunity to play uh, Test match cricket is what we've strived for for a long time. A lot of people have put in a lot of work behind the scenes. Players that have gone before have done their utmost to to get Ireland into this position, and therefore, Test match cricket's very, very welcome. Um, hello, mate. Tuffers here. Um, we, we, we were talking there earlier on about franchise cricket and everything. Do you sort of feel, you know, that we, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to get this foothold in Test match cricket and everything? Are you sort of sitting there thinking to yourself, well, in ten years' time, it might not even be happening? What's your sort of take on the way that it's all sort of developing? Well, I think the global game is changing, isn't it? But if you speak to any cricketer um, that, that plays the game, test match cricket is, is what they want to, to do and what they want to achieve and why why they take up the game in the first place. Um, but but you're right that the franchise world uh, is going to have a huge impact. Um, even on your guys like, and your sort of... Your, 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 yeah, well, your... yeah, even... Tonight, Josh Little, yeah. the first Irish yeah. player to play in the yeah. IPL, uh, has done extremely well uh, for yeah. his first season there. He's not going to be at Lords. Um, just he, he's been on the road for five months. I mentioned the the, the the World Cup qualifiers coming up in Zimbabwe in in a couple of weeks' time, and he's a guy who's gone around for the last five months bowling four overs, four overs, four overs, four overs, and to go into a Test match. Where you might need to bowl 20 overs on Thursday, maybe another 20 to back it up on on Friday. Um, you know, it's a it's a it's a big challenge to be able to to juggle that. And uh, you know, from our point of view, we need to make sure that and his we need to make sure that he's ready for those World Cup qualifiers, which are extremely important. Stephen, you're nodding along at that. I think sometimes cricket, we cricket fans under underestimate that swift change in format. Yeah, it's it's very very difficult, and I don't envy. Um, Ireland at all in the sense that you have to think about the player 
and his welfare. I mean, there's no doubt that everyone in Ireland and everyone, I would love to have watched Josh Little bowling at Lords yeah. in a test match against England. I think it would have been fascinating. Um, and I think it would have been a great challenge for the English batters to, um, to face him because he's an outstanding young bowler. Um, but these are the nuances that, that we're going to have to deal with and administrators are going to have to deal with as we move forward um, is balancing the happiness of the player because if Ireland demand that he comes back from the IPL a week early and he misses out on playing in the IPL final and being there at the business end of the tournament um, to play a test match at Lords that could cause friction between the player and the country. Um, and on the flip side of that, when Ireland go to play in their World Cup qualifiers to hopefully qualify for the World Cup, you've got a guy there who's played in an IPL final and experienced that pressure and he can impart that knowledge onto the, the other players in that Irish team. So there are so many caveats to, to this franchise versus country debate at the moment and I don't think whichever side of the coin that you fall on um, I still think you'll be able to see the other side's argument quite fairly and how is your strength in depth then Andrew when you are trying to to juggle all of this I mean England could put out three different white ball teams if they wanted to and that's before we've even got to a to a test side how's your strength in depth yeah well uh, it was just something I was going to mention to you there you know we're not like a lot of companies who have you know twenty seam bowlers um, to, to yeah. pick from, um, which, which makes I suppose our, our progress uh, uh, and some of our achievements you know even even greater when you you look at the the playing pool we have across Ireland. Um, but but I think what it does do is it it, it creates a situation where we we have to fast track players and we've got to get them more exposure uh, sooner maybe than than would have been ideal. But out of that. You, you'll find players who, who rise to the challenge and uh, you know we're hoping at, at Lords on Thursday that we have a few more guys who, who you know they talk about visiting players raising their game at Lords and, and hopefully our guys do exactly that um, and, and then when you look ahead to, to World Cup qualifiers how how important is a World Cup to Ireland? They're extremely important not just to us but to, to all the teams that are there trying to qualify everybody has got got the, the goal of, of getting to a World Cup uh, to, to, to different countries it means different things you know the West Indies and Sri Lanka are going to the qualifiers uh, in Zimbabwe probably as the two the two favourite teams but uh, you know having been involved in these qualifying tournaments down the years it never works out like that and uh, you know so only two teams qualify out of the ten um, and, and that will make you know a ten team World Cup there's plenty of arguments for saying that well, you know, yes. why is it a 10 team yeah. World Cup that opens up another mm -hmm. can of worms which you probably don't want to go into tonight but um, you know so it, I suppose it goes back to what Stephen was saying there in terms of making sure that, that Josh Little is ready and firing and, and everybody's fit and available It was some test the 2019 test wasn't it oh. I mean Ireland bowled England oh. out for 85 were absolutely flying at that stage but were then bowled out for 38 themselves yeah, well, we we were in dream world uh, yeah. on that first morning at Lords. Um, you know, I was in the long room whenever the guys walked out, and uh, as a former player, it, it was emotional to to see them go out onto the, the hallowed turf. But then to to bowl England out for eighty five was was outstanding. Um, you know, I think we needed one hundred and eighty to win the test in the final innings, and that was during an extremely hot period in London. Uh, but on that that morning that we were needing 180 to win it was dark it was overcast it was humid and uh, we ended up getting the worst of the conditions and uh, mm. yeah we got uh, we got bundled out by Wokes and, uh, and Stuart Broad but um, yeah let's see what happens on Thursday I think the last time I was chatting to you Tuffers was the, the night before yeah. um, the T20 World Cup game and the MCG and we weren't sure what was going to happen the next mm -hmm. day and well who knows come Thursday yeah Good yep, luck. Good luck. Jack Leach got ninety. Jack Leach got ninety-one, didn't he? Got, yeah, that, got us right out of trouble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Opening the batting, he went in the night before as the night watchman, and uh, was a thorn. Was that was the proverbial thorn in the side? I have to say, for us, because uh, had he not got runs, yeah. we might have been chasing thirty to win it. As you, as you say, Andrew, anything can happen in this game, can't it? I uh, hope it goes well for you. Enjoy, Lords. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that, Andrew mate. White, Ireland's uh, men's national team selector with us on Five Live Cricket.
Uh, are, England, are England in many ways, just a final one here before we bring Colin here, England, is it a bit of a hiding to nothing for England, this, whatever they do, Stephen? Um, no, I think it's great preparation. Um, I think the Ireland team are coming probably better prepared than they were four years ago. Um, that team was full of older generation, um, domestic players who were then playing for Ireland in that test mm. match. Um, you now, you've now got a really hungry young crop of Irish players now with a really exciting middle order from a batting perspective. Um, guys who did really well in the tests in Sri Lanka and then um, against Bangladesh recently in ODIs. Um, so I think it's a great challenge for England to come up against a young, hungry side that are going to want to do well and put on a show. There's all fantastic support for Ireland in these games. I remember it being a great atmosphere yeah. at the test match in 2019 there. Um, so it's a great challenge for England to steal themselves before the Ashes series, I think. It feels mumbling in the background. Well, no, 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 not at all. Great bit of preparation. Great preparation, as you say, all about reconnecting and getting the boys in that rhythm. You know, he's a, he's a, he's a rhythm kind of guy, um, um, Brendan McCullough. Brendan McCullough. He, he, and so that's what it's going to be used for. I'm, I'm pretty sure England will go out there and play pretty well. Mm. 